Hey, I got it. What are you? All right. Joining us now, she's the head coach of the Iowa Hawkeyes. They just finished up their uh, Big Four Classic as they continue to wrap up the fall. And, of course, the NIC 2023 champions went coming off 35 wins, the most wins in the program history since 2009, first time in postseason for the program since 2009. Of course, I speak of head coach Renee Gillespie. How you doing? Great, Eric. Thank you for having me on. I want to talk about last year first. 35 okay. wins, you get to the NIC, which we'll get into because you had a dramatic championship win over BYU. When you reflect on last year, what comes to your mind? Oh, goodness. Um, youth <laughs> was for one of them. Um, very young. We had five starting freshmen on our team last year. But um, with those five freshmen, we also came a lot of energy. And, and I think what you saw with that is, um, the energy and and not really knowing what to expect. I think a lot of the freshmen were just, you know, wide eyed and let's go and and didn't think twice about what they were doing. And and it kind of made that excitement in playing for them, you know, like it was every game's a new game and they didn't have any predetermined expectations of what was going to happen. Um, but along with that came a lot of tenacity in their part. We always talk about tenacity and grit in this team. And, and we want that with, with all our players. And and I believe those freshmen came in and they, they bought into that and they, they saw that all season long. Talk, take me through the process of accepting the bid, go to the NIC, go into Colorado, and then making that incredible run that was capped off by that dramatic win over BYU in the championship game to win this championship why did you feel that was important for this program uh and obviously a successful one yeah well we we felt like in in the the year when we were playing conference only we we couldn't play postseason at that time um or out of out of conference games um we we should have had an opportunity to go to regionals that year we really felt strong that that we would have had an opportunity to go that year and so it it that kind of took us a, um, a couple back steps on on getting our players to understand what it feels like to get in the postseason, what it takes to get in the postseason, and being able to have the um, NISC available to us. We looked last year or two years ago of getting in it. We weren't ready. Um, we felt like we needed another year to to give us an opportunity to get into the NCAA's. And then when we weren't um, in in that selection of last year, you know, we just felt like the NISC is going to give us that step we need, that push we need. Um, one being as young as we were, and um, to allow our players to understand how it feels to be in postseason, how to play in postseason. Um, and so our administration, they were so gracious to us, that, you know, said let's let's do this, let's make this happen. And and uh, when we did, we just we felt like we had to do everything we could to to win this win this tournament, so they could feel what it's like to to win a championship. How important was that for the program? I mentioned the program had not been to postseason since 2009. Just to get a taste of that, you mentioned it, to, for the players to get a taste of that. And historically, teams that have performed in the NIC have done well the following year. Baylor is an example. Glenn Moore, where I had last year, told me that going playing in the NIC and winning that was huge for his team because he had a young roster and he felt yeah. it would help him. And they had a great year last year as a result of that getting back to the NCAA. Is that kind of the, the vision there as well? Yeah, that, that's exactly. We saw what Baylor did the year before. I mean, it, um, Liberty was one of the first winners on the NISC, yeah. and they they took off the year after that. And you you saw that across the board of of programs being able to get their kids into that position. Um, you know, it takes a lot of it, it takes a lot of wins one to get in the NCAA, but also um, a lot of cross fingers and prayers, and you know, because you got a committee deciding on who's going to go in those. And those at large bids, you know, so, you know, one, you have to win the conference championship. We've done that before when we were at UCF and now at Iowa, we knew we had to get to that point of being able to to get our name high enough in the in the Big Ten to be able to go. Um, and when we did and we had to figure out a way of being able to to give that postseason feel to our players. And, um, you know, the NIS, NISC, the Triple Crown, they do a fantastic job of putting that together. Um, it, it, it was all about championship when we went up there playing Maryland, you know, and, and seeing that, that feeling of, of competitiveness that we had up there with the great teams that were in that, in that tournament. Um, so it, it was exactly right. Glenn, exactly right. It's like, you, you have to get them there to understand how to get back. 
And, and this NISE gave us that step. So now they understand what it takes to, to not only just go to the championship, but be able to be in it and to win it. So, and now they have that drive. Um, you can see even coming in this year that there's a different mentality to the players. They're hungry. They're, they're working harder in the weight room than they ever have putting in the extra time. And, and now you're starting to see that, that excitement happening, realizing that we have the opportunity for the NCAA. BYU game. That was as crazy of a game as it gets, because uh, I remember watching it live, uh, and it, 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 I'll let you describe it, because you had the lead most of the game, but BYU Gordon Eakins, a well, obviously they're a well-coached team. They come back. Matty Baharan, and this, I, I'm not going to lie, as somebody that is co- uh, both, I I, I was uh, kind of had a bit of a smirk on my uh Happy face. for her. <laughs> well, because obviously, for those that don't know the story, Matty Baharan yeah. played at UCF. Yeah, yeah arguably, arguably had that's right. You recruited her. Yeah, but arguably had the biggest hit in program history in the regionals against Michigan with two outs in the bottom of the seventh to tie the game and then hit the walk off base hit to win that regional game for Michigan that helped UCF get to the winners bracket and eventually win the regional twenty two. She transferred to BYU, had a great year. You pitched to her, <laughs> and she crushed. I you. warned him. I warned him. Right. <laughs> So I wasn't yeah. shocked she delivered again, but your yeah. team responded in the bottom half of the inning and walked them off. Just take me through that game. Oh, I, it's all blur right now. I, I, <laughs> it really is. Uh, it was just a crazy game back and forth. You know, we, like you said, we we were leading the, in the first part of the game, and then they came back with a that huge home run, and you know it was it was so hard. It was I was excited for her, and yet I was frustrated that it was her that made that right. that got that home run. Um, but it, so it was, it was just a great opportunity for them to come back. Now we were down, well, we were down by five, I believe going into the seventh inning and it was crazy. Yeah. Some score. Yeah, it was wild. down by five. And, and so we're looking down by five and, and I can tell you this, that at that point, I think most of my family members shut the TV off, <laughs> you know, and, and they missed the best part of the game because, you know, here we're in the seventh inning, we're down, down by five. We have two outs and no one on base in the seventh inning. And for this to, to completely turn around between a runner getting on, getting a base hit, um, we end up pinch hitting two kids off the bench. We had an opportunity to bring two. One hadn't even seen a, a bat in her hands in almost a month, but we felt like she she probably had the best opportunity to hit this pitcher. So putting her in. So two pinch hitters end up coming up with big hits for us, a double that ended up scoring the first run and another double that ended up scored, I think the third run. But then it was like, it was just crazy. It was like the whole, with the two outs, they called timeout. And, and it was like, it was like, we just felt like the momentum already changed at that point when they called timeout in the seventh inning with two outs and no one on, it was just this feeling that happened. And I think our players felt it too. There was just the change of the tide and then our kids just went crazy at the plate and end up, you know, going up by two. And then we have to hold them. We have to hold them in the bottom of the seventh inning to to be able to win the game. But it was just I I can't even write that script in any game I've ever been a part of. I've got we've come back from a lot of games down, but usually in the fifth inning, it's <laughs> not ever in the seventh inning with two outs and down by five. Five runs, crazy. scored five runs. Yeah, and beat them nine to seven was the final score in that game. It, it was just, it was crazy. Just the whole process of that game. Well, and, and I would imagine that's a big lesson too, moving forward for your, the returners that you can come back at any point in a game. Like Heather Tard mentioned that. And we saw that in the regionals when Washington came back the way they did in this against McNeese down. They to did the same three, thing. Right. Yep, they did the same thing. Kind of, so, that's got to be a message too now that those players know that because they've, they've they've done it they've seen it you know they've seen it up close yeah that's exactly right and you know we, when we talk about tenacity and grit I mean that was it you you're not the game isn't over you know it's until that last out that game is is not over and I, and I I, I see our freshmen especially the five freshmen that started last year um, and now we've got a great senior class I mean Sammy was playing first base for us all last year um, senior. Um, Grace Bain, shortstop, senior, um, Bradley Klosterman, senior, you know, so we, we have a great group of seniors that were a part of that, that saw it. And Amber Diaz, you know, she played, or Amber uh, Decina, she played a little bit in the uh, second base position last year. 
and you saw those seniors one wanting it and hungry and then you see those freshmen learning how to do it and now you've got that combination coming in this year with another set of freshmen we may have another three freshmen starting for us i mean just the level of talent that we're able to bring in now um so it's it's just a strong strong group of young ladies i mean they're excited about it they are so motivated to to go on. And I know our seniors for one, having five seniors, they, they want it this year. They, they want the NCAA. So there's a, there's a, a big push and big passion this year for them to, to make it in this year. What was, uh, what went through your mind when you got that final out, you beat BYU, win that championship. I remember the all post you with know, the, the championship. Yeah. I mean, that, that's something that you'll certainly remember. What was that like for you? I was just so excited for, for our players, you know, to, for them, like you said, to learn that, to see that, to be a part of that, to understand that it's it's never over, and and for the two kids coming off the bench, being able to 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 make things happen, to to come back in that inning, um, it was exciting to see. It doesn't matter if you're one of the starters or you're a backup. Your opportunity is going to come, and you better be ready. When it comes, you better be ready. And that was a message that we saw in that game: is you know, you two kids off the bench, let's get it done. It doesn't matter. Let's get it done. So now we fast forward to the fall. You just finished doing the big four I classic there. What have you learned so far about this group so far as you go through this fall? I, I see a lot of the same things like we talk about. It's just that that desire. Um, the freshmen coming in are hungry. You know, they they haven't experienced what what our team from last year experienced, but they're hearing the stories. They're they're seeing the push from the upperclassmen now. Um, they're, they're jumping in and running with it. And like I said, we may have three more freshman starters next year. We're still a very young team. Um, but that's exciting too. You know, that's exciting to be able to have them experience what, what our team last year experienced. Um, they just, they want that opportunity for the NCAAs, you know, and it's going to take a lot of hard work. And, um, I feel like we have the pitchers that came in this year. We've got two good freshmen that, that stepped in this year and are seeing some good things this fall. Um, and we've got Jalen back from last year that that basically won that game for us. Um, you know, you're you're saying, you know, you're just seeing a lot of of um depth now that we haven't had in the past. This is probably the first year that we're finally getting some depth in each position. Let's talk about pitching because that's where it starts. Uh yeah. tell me about your pitchers. Obviously, uh big improvements last year. Uh Mandy Gardner in her first year asked the pitching coach obviously helped in that. Just talk about your staff as a whole, pitching-wise, and obviously Mandy now coming into her second year. Yeah, Man Mandy's just done wonders for our, our pitching staff. Um, she she does a great job not not only teaching them fundamentals and, and giving them a kind of insight of the game. I mean, she played at Michigan and Maryland. She was there two years at Michigan and then two years at Maryland and and then coached for eight years at Grand Canyon and, and did all the pitching during the Grand Canyon days. So she understands what it's like to be able to get to postseason to to play in the regional championship, both as a player and as a coach. So she's she's bringing a lot of that knowledge to the to the team. Um, and I think our recruiting has gotten that much better. She's done a fantastic job of bringing in the, the pitchers that she knows she can work with. She knows she can make better. Um, Jaylee Ojo, she's, she's come in and she's done a wonderful job already as a freshman, just stepping in. Um, Andy came in from, from Wisconsin, Madison, Wisconsin, and she's, she's surprising herself. Like she, we kind of, she, Mandy kind of broke her down this fall and, and rebuilt her. Um, and she's just a, a totally different pitcher now. Like she's throwing 67, 68. She hit a high 68 in, in the fall game. And she goes, she's never seen those numbers before. So you're getting some freshmen now that that Mandy's working with one on one and and really seeing some big big improvements from. Um, but then again, you, like I say, you got Jalen coming back. We got another um, freshman pitcher, Maya, who's coming in um, from Georgia. Um, she's one that didn't really have a pitching coach um, per se when she was you know growing up, so she really hadn't had someone to work with her on a daily basis. And you're seeing huge improvements in her already. Um, she's one of our big hitters as well, and we like pitches that hit. So a lot of our pitchers, we only have two um, pitching only pitchers. So um, all of the pitchers that we have on the staff right now, except for those two actually are hitting for us. And um, a lot of them have power. So we're we're going to be utilizing that best we can and find ways to get them in the lineup and, and be able to utilize them. Jalen Adams, as we reference, do you feel that she's the leader of the pitching staff? Do you have a leader right now? Is that still kind of evolving? 
Yeah, I think I think Jalen, we consider Jalen the leader right now. She's she went out and we went against Iowa State in the big four and and had a great outing with them. Um, you know, we wanted to see how far she could go. You know, we had we had a staff set up for that game and we wanted to see how far she could go. She pitched all nine innings. She she did an incredible job. We ended up beating them three to nothing in a fall game. It's, it's fall, you know, but still she was able to stay nine innings and we didn't expect that at all in the, in the fall. We, we thought we'd get maybe five or six out of her, but she was still going strong even in the ninth. So she's definitely one of our top, top leaders. Um, it's crazy to think that she's a leader as a sophomore, you know, but she's the one stepping up. And, and like I said, a very young pitching staff right now was we've got, two sophomores and four freshmen. So it's, it's going to be crazy to see what it's going to be like this year. Yeah. You got kids like Kelsey Winters and retro <laughs> freshman out of Tampa, Florida. You mentioned Maya Clark uh, among them there. Uh, what's the key to developing young pitchers? Uh, and then, cause each one has their own kind of pace, right? Everybody kind of learns in a different tone. So how do you kind of help develop young pitchers? Yeah. I, I think Mandy's got a, a good set of ideas on how to, build them. You know, we, we work a lot on fundamentals early on, um, being able to, to see what their strengths are and then be able to bring one more pitch into the, into the set. That's, that's kind of what we look at. If we can get one a year, one pitch a year, we're, we're going to be doing good. So a lot of the pitches that you're seeing have, that have had improvements, um, have been working on kids that are maybe a drop ball pitcher and we get them a change up. Or we have a drop ball pitcher, we we develop a drop curve or something that's going to be a little bit different, or even screwball that looks a little different. Uh, we're more north south as a as a team. I think we really kind of live there. Um, but each one of our pitchers has like one east west pitch that they kind of like, and it's kind of been working on. Um, but we don't try to go crazy with like the number of pitches. If we can get you know three in their arsenal, then we're going to be sticking with those three. Um, and I think that's what helps them. And they're not so all over the place trying to develop, you know, five different pitches. Um, we just really work hard on on one to two in the fall and and help develop those two. One pitcher you developed throughout the, during your time at UCF was uh, Shelby Turnier, who is being inducted <laughs> into the UCF Athletic Hall of Fame in November. It's your third pitcher that it's going to the UCF Hall of Fame, yeah. uh, joining Allison Kai and Mackenzie Otis. That's uh, that, I mean, it doesn't get old when you hear those news, right? What you, what was your reaction when you heard she getting in? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I, every one of them. I get so excited about the opportunity for them to be in the in the Hall of Fame, and it was tough during those years. I mean, we we changed four conferences in in the 18 <laughs> years I was there, you know, and and I kind of joke. I said I think we went through eight athletic directors at the same time, so it wasn't easy. But it was like the the they really did such a great job, Shelby and and uh, Mackenzie Otis, and you know. They, they just, they understood those two together. Oh my gosh, that was a dynamic duo. They had the lowest ERA as a dual pitcher in the country that year, you know, and, and that says a lot for their work ethic and and what they brought into the program. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm like, you know, I've, I've been the pitching coach for years and, and love that piece of it. And for Mandy to come into Iowa and help us out here has been great, but, you know, I, I miss a piece of that because I, I do love working with them. I love being able to to see what they have to to bring to the program. And you know that our game is 80% pitching. So you've got to have that piece of it in order to be successful. But um, yeah, so Shelby, Shelby getting in the Hall of Fame. It's it's really exciting. I'm I'm gonna make sure I get back to that one. I know. Hopefully you remember how to get to there. Yeah. <laughs> I got a flight from Cedar Rapids to Orlando. That's what I gotta worry about. Go from there. That's a good start. That's a good start. You mentioned, you know, Mandy, do you see a lot of yourself in her, in her style, in her, in her philosophies? Is that why you two, it seems like, and just talking to both of you over the last year, you two have clicked, like they're on the same page. Not that, you know, but it just seems like there's a lot of similarities in both your styles. Is that accurate? I, I think so. I think, I think we're both fundamentalists. I, I think what we, we look for, we don't try to change a pitcher's style. You know, that's, that's who they are. Um, we don't try to break them down and make them into, you know, mechanical you know the same form the same we want we want individualized pitchers we're bringing them in because we're seeing something that we like in them that's why they're they're coming in um but there's there's no changes that happen with pitchers that is their own personality we're just we both are like that we just do little tweaks to to make them better you know working on their leg drive being able to to get a little more you know arm arm speed and being able to be a little bit stronger with your snaps i mean this it's a very fundamental thing i think we both see that 
in our pitches and, and how we develop them. And we don't try to throw a lot of pitches out there. I mean, I think that's crazy when, you know, I've had pitchers that have, have written to me, you know, recruiting and written to me and said, Oh yeah, I've got, I've got eight different pitches. I'm like, Oh, what eight, eight pitches do you have? Cause I only know of like four. Right. <laughs> so, so getting them to kind of understand that you don't have to have so many pitches. You just have to be efficient in a few. And if you're efficient in a few and you build on those and you're going to be a, you're going to be a pretty good darn, darn good pitcher. Like Shelby. I mean, she lived on her drop curve. I mean, she could get anybody out on her drop curve. It was the nastiest pitch I was thinking. And then she'd throw a little change up and occasional rise and she'd have you, you know, and the McKenzie with, with her, you know, change up. Oh my gosh. I mean, she killed people with her change up, you know, they, they just buckled their knees anytime she had that throwing to them. So it was just, it was neat to see that you can keep them the way they want to be as a pitcher. You don't have to change them. Well, that's interesting. It's a good comparison because you had Allison, she came over as a transfer from uh, what junior college, right? Hillsborough. Yeah. Uh, yep. After one year, she transferred to UCF because she had a verbal commitment. She didn't want to break that. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, as the story goes, so you got her a year in, and she had some injuries her first year. Mackenzie came out of high school, and Shelby's high school. What do you remember? You know, you obviously recruited all three, but once you got them on campus and kind of that process of developing them into who they became eventually. Mm-hmm. It was it was them. It was the hard work. It was the dedication. They were committed to their their craft. Um, you know, every one of those pitchers were ones that would come out and they would put in an hour and a half every day in practice in the, in the bullpen and do an extra when they needed to. Um, when you think about what, what they accomplished, you know, between you looking at Shelby coming in and, and taking the load, you know, and, and, and then McKenzie, the two of them being able to have back to back that, that dynamic duo of those two was, was a coach's dream because you had two number ones that year that could throw in any game. And then you had that number two or that um, the number one backing them up. So they were backing each other up in every single game. One would start, one would finish if we needed to. Um, but most cases they were finishing games themselves, but they were hard workers. And I think as we, we see what we have now, Jalen, she's one of the hardest working pitchers that that I've seen in years. You know, she's right up there with McKenzie and, and, and uh, Shelby and um, Kime, you know, I mean, those pitchers are all hardworking pitchers. You've got to have that mentality and that passion to pitch in order to put the time in to be successful. You also have some Hall of Famers at UCF. They were offensive players. Stephanie Best, obviously the most notable, yeah. who you got to be at her. She got inducted into the A Sun Hall of Fame this offseason. You got to attend that. Natalie Land another one that's in the UCF Athletic Hall of Fame. First of all, what it was like to attend Stephanie's A Sun Hall of Fame uh, ceremony. Yeah, I mean that is it's it's incredible to be inducted into your college Hall of Fame, but to be inducted into the conference Hall of Fame is something totally different. I mean, you're the best of anyone that was in that conference, which is that's hard to accomplish that that feat. And Stephanie, I mean, so so deserving of of being inducted in the in the A Sun, and that was the first conference that we were part of when we first started at, at UCF, and and seeing that that program grow and the and the teams that they have now in the A Sun, you know, it's it's fun to watch them even now, you know, to to see the competition still going in the A Sun. Um, but it was a neat, they did a wonderful job um, bringing her in and and the ceremony itself and just everything about it. They, it was first class. They did a wonderful job with the induction and just so proud of Stephanie, everything that she deserves. You know, you talk about hard work. I mean, it, it'll get you there. You gotta, you gotta put in the time, the energy and the passion to get you there. But it, Stephanie was the ultimate hard worker. You know, I don't know if she ever told you, like we would be after practice for an hour every day. I'm throwing batting practice to her and she is going until she gets so many home runs over the fence. Like it was just that that's, she wanted to perfect her, her hitting so much that she would put in that extra time every single day to make sure that it was where she wanted to be. And that's when you see great athletes across the country, you see it mostly in men's sports with all the professionals. You don't get that many professional women's sports, but she would have been in it you know. And she played professional with NPF, but it's, it's like, you know, those are those are the top athletes, the ones that have that drive and that passion, and she she had all of that. 
Yeah, should have been an All American. Probably would have yeah. been if UCF was like in the American or the Big Twelve like they are now. She would have gotten yeah. more recognition. Her players like her and Natalie and uh, Allison. Natalie Lamp played for the U.S. national team in baseball. Uh, yeah, pretty good athlete. So that's a good segue. So you know how this works. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to compare any of your current players to Stephanie Best, but I am curious, who is the hardworking player leader that was like a Stephanie Best, like a Natalie Land? There were two of the hardest working players you ever had in your UCF program. Yeah. Who is that player on the offensive side for Iowa uh, this year so far that you've noticed? Wow. And see, that's tough because if you asked me a year ago, that wouldn't have been a tough question. Now, after winning the championship, they they are all bought in. I I don't see one that does not come in and d- does the extras. Um, gosh, I, like our our shortstop Tori, she's Tori Bennett. She's she's always working on her craft. She's always in there taking extra cuts doing she can. Um, she's been down this fall, but she's she's on her way back and she's like hungry, so hungry. Um, seniors it would be probably um sammy diaz in the cages constantly constantly um amber dia decina in the cages constantly um grace baines in the cages um you know they're just avery um i think you saw avery jackson last year's played played third for us last year just as a freshman in the cages constantly always working on her craft um you know it's just it's fun to watch because i think you saw nia last year breaking records, you know, our right fielder, Nia Carter. She was that one that was constantly working on a craft, hitting over 400. I mean, th- this kid was a hard, hard worker. Um, and you're seeing these these kids understanding what it takes now and then the buy-in now. You know, I would say back when Stephanie was there, she was probably the one that um, understood it. And since we're such a young program, you really didn't have that buy-in yet. I, I think now we have that buy-in. We we have that understanding of of how much you have to work to get what you want. Um, so yeah, and and I would say as far as, as far as pitching staff, Jalen, gosh, that girl works hard. She she's a bulldog. She's like in the cages, uh, bullpens constantly, and she hits for us too. So she's always working. She has to do double time everybody else. So she's not only in the bullpens doing pitching, but then she has to come back and do hitting. So. A lot of times it's on her own because, you know, we only have four hours now with the players. So she has to kind of balance everything out. But as far as the the top, like mentality, tough, tough kid, I'd probably say it's probably Jalen. And, and it's interesting. Again, it re- it sounds to me that for the returners, the switch, that championship, you, you've seen the difference already. There is a yeah. big difference. Yeah. And that's what you want as coaches. You, you know, you can, you can coach them all you want. You can talk to them all you want, but until they see it, they feel it, they understand it. it it's hard to flip that switch with them. It is. It, it has to be something that well, I always say it, it. it's so much, it's, it's the point when you are being pulled towards something and not pushed towards something. If coaches are having to push you towards something, you're not going to get there. But if you're pulled towards that and you're hungry to get there and you have that drive to put in those extra hours, You'll, you'll get where you want to go. Who are the, uh, talk about some of the position players, either the new faces you think will contribute offensively and some of the ones you also lead by example offensively from a production standpoint. Well, I, I think definitely Grace Baines. She, she's been a master of, of developing her skills over the last four years as a senior. I think you'll see a lot of great things from her this year, just a consistent offensively and defensive consistent um, I think you'll see things from Tatiana. We haven't even kind of talked about Tatiana. She played center field for us last year. She's on the Puerto Rican national team. Um, she's actually going to be down in Puerto Rico uh, doing the international games here in November. So she's really excited about that over Thanksgiving. So she's excited about that. Um, she's one that you'll you'll see some production from too. She's she's the kind of kid that wants the bat in her hands when when being called. Um, I think you're going to see some things, Jaylee, um, when we talk about freshmen come in, Jaylee, not only as a pitcher, but she has a powerful, powerful swing. Th- this kid will be one of our big power hitters this year. So, Ojo, so you'll be keeping an eye on her this year. Um, she'll be seeing a lot of pitching time, and when she's not, she'll probably be in the lineup somewhere. Um, and I think um, Anna did a great job last year. Anna Streff, sophomore. Tori Bennett, sophomore. 
Uh, again, you're going to see some production out of them. New transfer that we brought in this year is a catcher, um, Hannah. She's going to do a great job underneath, behind the plate. But I think she transferred in from New Mexico State University and was able to, um, she was their key player last year, um, in the last two years. And I think she's going to be seeing some, um, a lot of playing time for us also behind the plate. Um, and then Maya, Maya is probably going to be, if she's not pitching, she's going to probably be playing in right field and she's got a big, strong bat. In fact, she's the one that had three of the runs. Uh, she had the three RBIs against um, Iowa state this, this last wow. weekend. Yeah. So we were getting runners on, we're getting them in. And Maya as a freshman is the one that came up and had two huge doubles that end up scoring those runs for us. Your offensive numbers drastically improved from last year, from the year before. Which is unique because, you know, Brian Levin came in to take over the offense. Sometimes there's a bit of a transition. Why was it a smooth transition with Brian running the offense? Yeah, I think Coach Levan came in. He had a he had a plan that worked for him both at Belmont when he was there as a head coach and and at Southern Miss. Um, you know, he, he's and it's interesting because I think that's why we all get along so well. We're all fundamentalists like we 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 deal with we work with the basics we work with the fundamentals we want the fundamentals to be strong uh, across the board and he's that way with the hitters um when you see how he breaks it down you know it's it's um pieces that can be understood and repeated and so when he does that the kids have an easier time of being able to adjust and make those small adjustments at the plate and I think you've seen and noticed that more than anything. I mean, we had a lot of uppercuts um, two years ago, and now we're starting to see kids getting more um, line drives, hard hit balls to the infield. You're starting to see some better hits. We're still working on the power piece of it, and that's a lot to do with strengthening the weight room, um, but also um, bat speed. So we're working on those two things um, along with it. Um, so I, th I think his fundamentals has been really good for our players. They're they're buying into it. They understand you know, how to be a good hitter, what they're looking for. Pitch selection is a big piece of it. You know, you could have to be the best hitter in the world. If you can't, you can't figure out if it's a ball or strike, you might struggle a little bit. So pitch selection has been, been a lot more improved from a year ago. And I think even this fall, we saw huge improvements, even from, even from last spring. Speak to the rest of your staff. It's an expanded staff, like everybody else, obviously in college softball with the third full-time assistant, everything like that. Just tell us a little bit about the rest of the staff you've, uh, you've kind of built there. Yeah, so so our volunteer coach that was Erin uh, Johnson, um, she was a volunteer. We brought her in as that as that third assistant position. Um, she's been working with the catchers, and we're seeing great improvements with the catchers. Uh, she's working with them on a daily basis now. Um, but she was a alum of Iowa, so she was with Gail Blevins in the World Series days. You know, back in the late '90s, early 2000s. So having her be a part of Iowa, loving Iowa, understanding what it takes to get to the World Series. Um, she went to uh, two World Series in her time here, um, able to understand what it takes to get there, but but um, also the mentality that it takes, you know, it just believe in yourself and being being focused. She, she said the first time that they that they got called to go to the regionals, they didn't think they're going to go. They they had they had packed up everything. They had put up all their clothes are all packed up. The uniforms are all packed away, you know, and and uh, Gail gets the call. Uh, we're in. And they're like. Huh you're kidding me, you know, and they're all rushing back, trying to get their, their stuff back in their suitcases and getting ready to go for regional. That was her first, that was their very first regional, or I'm sorry, world series opportunities. Um, and it was actually the regional opportunities to, to get there. And then they end up going a team that they didn't think would right. even make it into regionals ends up getting the world series. So she has that experience as a freshman, but then going back and being able to play on the big stage you know she she brings that to the players and she brings that energy and the excitement to the players every day um and you have you have to like you said you can't dream it you can't achieve it so she's helping them dream it she's helping them see what it's going to be like to be there feel what it's like to be there and and they're getting excited for for all their hard work now good story wow yeah uh, we do have a new we do have a new director of ops also oh, yeah 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 miranda right. she, yeah Miranda Meyer, she came in from Oklahoma. She was actually helped out with soccer at Oklahoma. So she's coming in and, and she's doing a great job for us. Uh, we kind of threw her right in the fire because when she came in right in the middle of all the recruiting, we're, we're getting in the middle of all of our players coming back from classes. Um, we're doing recruiting. I mean, it's just, it was 
crazy. And then all of our fall games and getting ready for our spring games and doing travel. And she has been a, a champion coming in and just well organized and keeping keeping us all sane. Um, you know, we got to send out some kudos to her because it's a, been amazing what she's done in only a month being here at, at Iowa. Wait until she, I start bothering her for like stuff. I have to ask questions. That oh, she will help she you out. She, yeah, she'll be a good one. <laughs> Uh, and she'll get back to you too, Eric. That's what's cool about it. That's good. No, that's good. <laughs> that's very good. Um, yeah, that's very good. Uh, I want to ask you about your facilities because now you're going some changes in the facilities that you've been working on for a while since so really the day you got there, right? Like since yeah. honestly, one of the when you got hired at Iowa when you left UCF, one of the things was, hey, we're gonna you know upgrade the facilities. Just talk about this. Where are we in that stage right now? Because we're now uh, entering a very important stage. We are um, like so. When we first was hired, when I was hired, they said we'd have a facility, a new facility, in three years. They wanted to move us to the what they call the west side of campus, which is field hockey, uh, indoor tennis facilities, and soccer. And uh, of course, COVID hits, and everything you know gets put on back burner. Um, but so this was so that didn't happen. So what we try to do is try to figure out what it would be best for us to be able to get our our games in. And the big thing that Big Ten always talked about was how many games we need to get our conference games in. And in order to get our conference games in, we've got to play in 28 degree wind chill factor, you know, which is insane to me. Um, and and being able to get all those games in. Well, in the last, what I've realized in the last three years of being here, um, coming from UCF, we played 42, 45 games at home. And, and now we're playing 13. Huge difference. And I'm all about dirt. I'm all about, I love the dirt. I love playing on natural grass. Well, that's great when you're in the conditions that you can have that in. But in the North, it's a very difficult thing to do because in the wintertime, as you get the snow, it's, it's thawing out. Even if the weather is nice, you, you can't even get in your fields because the permafrost is coming up and it's going to be wet. You can't get on it. So dealing with this for about two years, we're like, we've got to make some changes. And base was like, you're crazy. Why don't you have turf? It doesn't make any sense. You guys could play so many more games. They had 10 more games at home than, than we did. So we started looking into it. And Barbara Burke at the time um, was our deputy AD. And she had contacted the conference office to find out, are there any rules against turf? You know, we knew we were going to be hosting in 2024. We're going to be hosting this year, which we're excited about. Um, and she said, is there anything that's going to hold us back from, from putting turf in? They said, there are no rules. Um, the only rules is that it's recommended that you go by the NCAA uh, requirements, but it's not required to, to have turf. So we started moving forward three years ago and um, started doing the fundraising, started looking at at plans on what it's going like, to look like to get in, when we need to get it in, like, you know, how soon do we need to put it in so it'd be ready for the conference tournament. And so this last January or last June, we were able to start putting in the turf and laying it down and it looks fantastic. And, and being on it now and playing on it, I don't know why we didn't do that five years ago. It is the most beautiful stuff to play on. Every day you walk out to practice, it's drug, it's lined, it's mowed. You don't have to worry about all the maintenance that goes on to it. What I'm finding out, I was worried about the pitching mound of having dirt compared to turf. And so we were asking our pitchers, like, you know, would you do you are you okay on turf? Is it is it okay? And they're like, oh yeah, we love turf, you know, which surprised me. They said, oh yeah, we love playing on turf. We play on turf all the time. And what we realized is the summer leagues, when they're playing across the country, they're all playing on turf. So these players coming in, all of our prospects coming in, have all played on turf and they love it. It's it's more consistent bounces. It's it's easier to maintain. You don't have all the holes that you normally get or being rained out. We we had two games this fall that we would have been rained out had we not had turf. So there's a lot of benefits to it. So now we're we're in the point of being it's kind of a struggle right now. The Big Ten coaches are are a little concerned about playing the conference tournament on turf. And now we're doing a voting right now. It's all the way up to the athletic directors and whether or not we host this year, um, which shouldn't even go to that point. You know, Big Big Ten should have just said, look, that's not a rule. And let's go with it. And all the rules that that we put in have to have to um, be consistent with our rules. We have to go by the rules that we have in in place. And then if it doesn't work, we can vote on next year and we'll move forward. Um, but that wasn't the case. So um, on October 13th, we should be voting and hopefully knowing by the 13th on which direction they're going to go. But um, we we just feel like it's 
it's the place, it's the way to have games, the way to get games in. I know we'll get another 10 games in this year at home that we didn't get last year. Well, and we'll be able to get all of our conference games in because we won't get rained out as long as it's not lightning. Uh, we can play on it with, with the rain coming down. So the opportunities to play more games is there. And I, I'm a huge advocate now. I, if you asked me five years ago, I wouldn't have been. But being on it and seeing how, how the technology of the turf has changed has made all the difference in the world for us. Well, I think that's important that people understand because there might be some people that when they think of the field turf, they're thinking back to the days when we grew up in the 80s, 90s, when like the yeah. Houston Astrodome, you know, they were playing on carpet and, that, you know, and hard carpet. <laughs> it was not safe. That's not the case anymore. The, no. the scientifically, there are advanced stats there uh, and information that it is just as safe as you're playing on grass, if not more. And I've been surprised. Uh, if you ask a lot of players that play professionally, whether it be in the NPF or the WPF internationally, they they like the field turf. They're used to it. They're comfortable with it. Uh, and, and they feel actually their footing will be good, unlike sometimes in some of these fields where it gets beat up. The tarp is not so great. Now you're playing in muddled water. You might misstep, and now you got to blow it out. So I think it's kind of where we're headed with everything is the field turf, to be honest. Plus, add to the fact uh, Big Ten, it's no secret, uh, is adding members uh, starting next year that's from the West Coast. I would think from a Big Ten uh, school situation, you want to have as much flexibility to stay home to limit the travel that you're going to have to do. You already do a lot of travel non-conference. Now you're going to have to do more as with this big as the league grows. So I would think you would want more home games. But what do I know? Yeah, and, and you're absolutely right. I mean, you look at uh, our Olympics. Our Olympics play is on turf. Yeah. You know, it, it, and, and you talk to the Olympians, like you talked about is like, they, they love it. They, they feel like it's a, a truer surface to play on. Um, yeah. I think, I think it will be going that direction. I know the NCAA is talking a lot about um, we had our, we had a super regional team that, that should have been hosting this year. And because they're all turf, they didn't get the opportunity to, turf, to, to host it. And that's not right. I mean, it should be, it should be your home field advantage, whether you've got synthetic dirt or you've got real dirt or turf, it's, it's all going to be a, a, a home field advantage on however you look at it. So it's, it's being able to have the opportunity to host a game, being able to get more games in um, less games canceled. I mean, that's a big piece for the Northern schools. And we've got to find a way of not getting all of our, our rain dates canceled. If you can play on it and if it's turf, you can play on it. If it's dirt and you've got a tarp, you'll be lucky. You might be pulling that tarp three or four times to get on and hopefully make a whole, a full game out of it where you've got turf, you got the full game. Now, so I, I think there's so many more advantages of turf that we're just not looking at. I think we've got some old school minds right now that think that, oh, it's it's not the way to go. But you look at soccer, you look at field hockey, you know, they're all going turf, football is going turf, baseball is going turf. And, and the benefits of turf is there. We just have to be um, like open minded enough to to make that an opportunity. And I can tell you, we have better opportunities in the north to be able to get our games in. And have that advantage now that the Sunday schools have right now, because we're definitely at a disadvantage with that. But I think you got to be creative if you're up north as far as getting games, whether it be at home, whether it be, I know you've played in the dome up there where, uh, what is it, north, uh, the, the, yeah, the you and I, there. you and I host. Is that yeah, what Minnesota. is that? Is that, is that a field turf? What's the field con uh, for the dome? Yeah, it's a, it's a football, indoor football facility. So they, they just mark it off for, um, they actually can, play two games in there which is kind of neat back right. back i mean game. those are unique i mean everybody's fine yeah. right Everybody Even rosemont like, nbf up rosemont, rosemont mpf yeah, yeah. The indoor like you, facilities. Last, you beat central Ar really good central arkansas team last year they have uh field turf in their yeah. facilities and uh as well so it's it just makes a ton of sense to me that that's the direction you're gonna go you're gonna get and there's a lot of schools i won't name them but there's schools in the south that have implemented field turf, not necessarily for the field condition, but for foul territory, the bullpen, to get practice in. Because as you know this from coaching in the South, it rains a lot in the summer and yeah. fall. And, you know, so that does help the field conditions. It, I, yeah, I, it, it, really, it really does. It, it gives you so many more opportunities to, to get practices and games in. Yeah, we're, we're excited about it. Our, our players absolutely love it. They talk about it every day. They know it getting out there. They and they can get on it themselves. Like they don't have to wait for someone to drag it or, or mow it. They can get out there and they can practice anytime they want. 
how many home games you believe you have added by having this field turf moving forward? Because there's a revenue side to this too. That that's the other part that by getting more home games, you're bringing in more revenue. So how many yeah. home games do you think you have added for this program with the field turf that you can't do? What is it? Ten games a year? What are we talking about? Yeah, I, I would say this year we probably because it was so late on on getting games um, added midweek. I'd say we're probably at about six more games where I think we can get easily 10 to 12 more home games in, in a season, you know, that, and that, that's, what's crazy. It's like, why wouldn't you take advantage of being home? You know, the wear and tear we put on these kids to, to travel all the time. I mean, that's, it's tough. And it's, it's trying to help with their quality of, of school as well as, you know, opportunity to play. You feel you could host a tournament maybe in early March. Is that the goal? Yeah, I mean, it'd be this year we might it's El Nino year, so we might be able to. It's supposed to be warmer earlier, so um, yeah, that's the only that's the only that draws uh, holds us back is is because we still have snow through February, and that's three weeks of our season already. Um, I think we can do a, a tournament probably in the mid March. I think March 15, 16. I think what we're going to try to do is uh, is um, we have an open weekend. We we decided not to travel since we were seven weeks on the road last year, seven straight weeks, and that's insane so we broke it up and we did three three tournaments and then we have an off weekend and then we play uh our spring break we'll have uh, northern california where we'll have um, a full week uh front side and back side weekend tournaments up there in california but that that weekend we're looking for teams right now that can come in on maybe a wednesday and thursday and play a three game series instead of five games and that would add three more games onto our home schedule this gives you some more versatility helps you uh yeah. revenue standpoint um and help you from a travel standpoint well i'm glad you yeah. brought up the travel standpoint because obviously the big news obviously next year will be you got ucla washington oregon all adding in there a lot of the media that doesn't quite frankly follow softball uh, i'll call them out <laughs> mainstream media that only worries about football oh you know and, and basketball is like what's gonna happen you know all these schools are traveling and so you know the travel and how they're gonna figure it out but you just brought it up. One of the things is you have to travel a lot as it is in the non-conference. So in a way, you kind of you're used to this. Is that, you know, I don't think it'll be as hard of an adjustment as maybe other sports will have because you you all have to travel a lot anyway in the non-conference. Yeah, I, I don't think it's going to affect us at all. I It'll affect probably Washington, Oregon, and UCLA because sure. they're not used yeah. to going to the, yeah. you know, cold weather to play. Um, but, but I think that travel, you know, whether it's East coast, whether it's West coast to us, it really doesn't matter. It's still the, the same amount of time. It'll take you seven hours to get anywhere. You know, it's a full day of travel, no matter what you do. So I, I don't foresee it being a, an issue for us. Now, UCLA going to Maryland or Maryland going to UCLA could, could be a long, day, a long travel across, across the country. Um, but I, I think they've got a plan. Like, I think they're doing a good job of, of keeping it balanced with softball i think baseball is the same way they they are finding a way of doing like an eight week so we're at seven weeks right now trying to do an eight week program um and just rotating it being able to kind of go on rpis and rotating it so um you you kind of keep that same format you're still traveling the same amount of times as you would before it just may be california instead of maryland or rutgers well, we'll get into that more next year. We got plenty of time to get yeah. over that. I know you got to run practice. Uh, real, you, you're opening the season. This has already been announced uh, at the NFCA leadoff classic in mm -hmm. Clearwater at Eddie yeah. Seymour Stadium. Take me through uh, the decision making start. That's a, 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 a stacked field. Yeah. Oh, we're so excited about being in it, being invited into it. Um, you know, it's it's a fun way to open up. And you're in Clearwater. The the atmosphere is insane. Your coverage is incredible with, with TV coverage over everything that weekend. Um, yeah, we're just we're just looking forward to to being able to be on the big stage again. You know, and getting the TV coverages, playing the big teams, um, being able to go head to head, kind of kind of proving who we are, what we're about. So um, it's going to be a fun weekend in, in the NFCA. Now we're actually going to be in, in Florida the next two weekends. Also, uh, we're looking at going to Jacksonville to play. UNF and and uh, Jacksonville and then we're um, heading up to spring games up in I think a lot of the teams northern teams will go to the spring games um, in Leesburg so we're heading there again this year too with with some good competition in, in that that weekend series also um, and then finishing out in northern California so it's it's going to be a fun fun season for us get to face your old uh, assistant Jeff Conrad who's over there at yeah UNF. <laughs> yeah uh, Jessica Yavari mm -hmm. now is a full-time assistant Cassidy Brewer's a full-time assistant back at UC you, you, you got a tree going here 
Yeah. Well, not not as as big as uh, Gail Blevins or um, you know, <laughs> Hutch at Michigan, but well, yeah, their trees go long. They and yeah. you know, there's a there's a lot of great coaches out there from a lot of great programs. I'm just excited that I always say as there if if I'm coaching, if I'm doing my job, I keep the love in these players that they want to continue to coach it and be a part of it. And when I see that, I know I didn't ruin them. <laughs> so hopefully I did something right that they love the sport still after they're done with us. This is true. Uh, yeah. Very true. Last question. What do you want to see between now and February that you think will be a key for this group to accomplish their goals? For the players? Yeah. Um, I would say the the one piece that we're really hitting hard is our weightlifting. What, what we're doing in the off season, getting stronger. Um, that was probably the piece that we, we needed more of last year. Um, and I think our off season conditioning, what they do over the winter months, um, how they hit the weights is really going to make a difference on where we are in the start of the season. Um, we tell them they've got four weeks without us, actually six weeks without us because in the rules, you're um, a week before finals, we can't be with them at all. So you're looking at almost six weeks before they come back to us. And that's a long period. If you're not doing anything, you're starting over. So getting their mindset of understanding, maintain what you've got, you know, work hard on the off season. And, and this group of, of young ladies, I, I truly believe will do that. I think they have that, that drive right now that they will be ready to go when, when January hits. That is Iowa head coach Renee Gillespie joining us here at In the Circle. Coach, always a pleasure. I think we've done now 16, 17 of these. Between in various <laughs> uh, ways. At least, at least, uh, yeah. So, you know, uh, but look forward to it. Obviously, folks can follow the hot guys there uh, and you're all the places there. And uh, we'll, we'll be seeing you in Florida. You're going to be coming down, as you mentioned, the next month. So we'll probably cross paths there, I have a feeling, and uh, definitely endure as well during the season. So uh, look forward to seeing you soon, Coach. Thanks for yeah, doing this. Yeah, me as too. I, I can't wait, Eric. And thank you again for having me on. This has been fun.